other board. First, I got a tiny bit bollocks up when I was deriving the representation theory for the n equals 1 and n equals 2 multiplets. Uh, the correct story is on that blackboard. We have the n equals 1 massless and massive multiplets and the number of boson and fermion degrees of freedom in each that balance on shell. And then the n equals 2 massless and massive multiplets. And again, the number of degrees, fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom that balance each other on shell. So you can just stare at those and play all the games you want. You can look at the n equals 1 representations, n equals 2 representations, and turn them into n equals 1 representations and count how you would describe the n equals 2 theory in n equals 1 language. You can look at the massive representations and figure out what the Higgs effect you need is in order to get the, give the vectors their mass. And you can compare the massive n equals 2 vector in both the short and the long form, the BPS form and the regular form, and wonder how the Higgs effect occurs in those two places. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but it's a, something to, to puzzle over as you're looking at it. One person asked me at lunch what I meant by a Clifford vacuum. Why, how can a vacuum have spin? And that's one thing I just wanted to clear up right before we start. The way that representation theory works is we're really using this method of Wigner of induced representation. So we're starting with a state, a real particle state, and then applying the creation and annihilation operators, which are taking you to different particles of the supersymmetric multiplet. So when I said the vacuum, for example, has spin one half or something, I don't mean the vacuum has spin one half. I mean the state in the Wigner sense had spin one half. It was starting with a spin one half particle, and then I was raising and lowering from there. So the Clifford vacuum isn't the real vacuum. It's just the vacuum you use a state to, cal to count the propagating states in supersymmetry. So that was the first half. The second half was an orgy of formalism on deriving covariant derivatives and transformations, left and right derivatives from a coset approach. We're going to use that today. The point of that orgy of formalism was to come up with uh, a left and a right covariant derivative, which I've defined on the top board. They each obey the symmetry algebra. They happen to have opposite signs for the left and the right derivatives. They commute with each other, which is what's very important. And the fact that they commute with each other allows you basically to define an isometry on the field by, for example, left derivatives and then a covariant derivative by the right derivatives. And because they commute, it guarantees that the isometries commute with the derivatives. And that we're going to use at our ears when we're representing supersymmetry in superspace. Okay? Now, the plan of the talk today is I'm going to finish what I didn't finish yesterday because I didn't realize the lecture was an hour and 15 minutes, which was to use this incredible formalism to talk about Lorentz invariant theories, n equals zero. Then we're going to look at n equals one superspace. I'm going to talk about what the coordinates are, what the covariant derivatives are, what the invariant actions are. We're going to go through some of the n equals one multiplets, the chiral multiplet, the vector multiplet, and then the linear multiplet for reasons to be revealed tomorrow. And then finally, we're going to talk about n equals 2 in terms of n equals 1 superspace, both the hypers and the vectors, and also n equal, the five dimensions in terms of n equals 1 superspace, both the hypers and the vectors. And Nima's wrote an incredibly beautiful paper on that, and he can go for that discussion, or he can just give the lecture, as the case may be. So let me start, so that should have given you enough time to catch up now. So let me start then by talking about n equals zero Lagrangians in the fancy language that we were talking about yesterday. And in the fancy language of yesterday, I made a coset element which was e to the i x dot p, where p is the, are some of these uh, generators of this algebra. And in general, as I said on the other board, that p a and p b, is equal to F A B C P C. That's the condition for this formalism to work so beautifully. But for the case of just translation generators in ordinary space, this is equal to zero. And so the formalism is just incredibly stupid, but we're going to use it anyway just to see how it works. So you can calculate omega inverse D omega, and you can calculate D of omega um, times 
omega inverse. Everything commutes, very easy. And basically you find when you calculate the left covariant derivative and the right covariant derivative, well, they're just derivatives. All the derivatives, the Virbinds, are all delta ma. And so dA left is just dA, and dA right is just dA. And that's why, of course, when you're doing regular field theory, you never even have to talk about any of this fancy business that we were talking about yesterday. So in particular, translational symmetries are realized by just regular derivatives on fields. And the covariant derivative is just the regular partial derivative. And so that's beautiful. Everything collapses. And so if I make a Lagrangian, which is a function of fields, which are functions of x, under such a transformation, the Lagrangian becomes fields, which are functions of x prime. And in particular, then the action, which is the integral over all of space of the Lagrangian is invariant. Automatically, So if I build the Lagrangian out of fields and their covariant derivatives, their partial derivatives, and you connect up all the indices, you're done. It's Lorentz invariant, Poincaré invariant. That's why you don't just stick random x's in the Lagrangian wherever you want. So in particular, I'm going to just write down this Lagrangian, and we're going to talk about it for a minute. That the Lagrangian can be written, for example, as minus dm phi, dm phi star. So this is some sort of scalar field. It might have a mass. I can have a Lagrangian for a fermion field, a vial fermion. And it can have a mass, and then it can have a complex conjugate so the Lagrangian is real. Good. And this Lagrangian, when integrated, gives an invariant action, and we're done. So that action is n equals zero supersymmetric, Poincaré invariant, but actually, we should also be able to see that it has an extra supersymmetry. It has a supersymmetry, a bigger symmetry, because these are exactly the fields of the massive n equals 1 multiplet that we talked about yesterday, right? Massive n equals 1. There's the chiral multiplet, which has two scalars and a vial. That's what that Lagrangian has. And it's a good exercise to check that there is a um, supersymmetry. where I rotate the Bose field into the spinner, and I rotate the spinner back into the Bose field. Since this is a boson and this is a fermion, the parameter, of course, is a fermion, and everything is consistent. And it is up to you to check it. Since this is a school on supersymmetry, I assume everybody here has done that. And if you haven't, you should not eat lunch. You should go and do it. So the fancy formalism that we've used has guaranteed that this theory is Poincaré invariant, but it hasn't guaranteed that it's supersymmetric. You have to just check that by hand. And uh, well, it's a certain amount of work to do so, which is why it might take you all of lunch if you've never done it. Now what I'd like to do is to close the algebra so you can commute two transformations on the, on the boson and on the fermion. And you really want to check that these transformations close into the supersymmetry algebra, right? Two of these supersymmetry transformations should give you a translation. Check that too. And you'll find that this simply works but this requires the fermion equation of motion. And so already you're starting to see some of the reasons you might be interested in actually studying superspace 
because in superspace we'll see that these symmetries are automatic. But when I look at this component Lagrangian, well, it's automatically Poincaré invariant, but it's not automatically supersymmetry, and there's some problems here. First, look at the transformation. It depends on the mass. So there's a different Susie transformation for each particle according to its mass. What if there's a Yukawa interaction? Well, then I have to put Yukawa terms in the supersymmetry transformation, it turns out. It becomes a nonlinear transformation in the fields when there's a Yukawa transformation, a Yukawa term. Also, look, closing the algebra requires the equations of motion. So this is the algebra that only holds on shell, modulo the fermion equations of motion. Maybe you'd like to close the algebra off shell without the equations of motion, too. And uh, we'll see how that works. But now what I'd like to do is to take the same Lagrangian and ask what happens if it has another supersymmetry as well. Well, if we look at the massive n equals 2 multiplets, oh, I should have written down, so even here I made a mistake. I could have written down hyper, which is um, 8 plus 8. I should have done that. Excuse me. And therefore, I need two vial fermions and four scalars. And so let me just stick an index here on these, where this index runs from 1 to 2. I don't want to, I'll stick an index on these. I do not want to stick indices on the fermions. I'm going to introduce another fermion. And I'm going to give it a mass as well, uh, and I'm going to give a mass to them in the following way. So this now describes two massive vial fermions and four real massive scalars, giving a eight plus eight dimensional hypermultiplet. And I want to ask what the supersymmetry transformations are here. And again, one can write them down. And the supersymmetry transformations then for the hyper becomes, well, there's two of them. Like that. And then there's a transformation for the field psi where it transforms into both bosons and it transforms into the epsilon and I have delta chi is 2 i sigma m epsilon bar i dm phi star i minus Two m phi i epsilon i. Now I have two fermionic symmetries, epsilon one and epsilon two, and so this becomes n equals two supersymmetry. And again, I tell you to check it. So you don't waste your entire lunch time checking it. Let me give you two hints. Because this is SU2, complex conjugation lowers the index naturally. And so phi star with an upper index is epsilon ij phi star with a lower index. So in particular, if this is phi 1, phi star 1 is actually phi 2 star. And you need a Fierce identity which for fermions looks something like this. For vowel fermions. Because in the closure on the transformation of the fermion, when I rotate the boson, I have three Fermi terms that have to be rearranged. I'm not kidding. 
If, you don't do, if, you, if, you, if you've never done it before and you do one thing at the school, check the supersymmetry algebra. And that checking provides the motivation for the remainder of my lectures. Because when you use superspace, where the supersymmetry transformations are implemented by differential operators, the closure of the algebra is automatic, guaranteed by this fancy formalism. In fact, guaranteed right by the commutator of the Ds. The problem, though, as you'll see, is that superspace can be kind of a mess. It really is only perfect for the case of n equals 1. And so there's sort of a religious war in the literature as to whether you prefer superspace, whether you prefer regular space. And many of the results actually were derived in regular space first, and the superspace was constructed later. But still, it's a beautiful arena for doing supersymmetry. It fits perfectly for n equals 1. And as you'll see tomorrow, not so good for n equals 2, because we'll end up in a big mess at the end of my lectures. But uh, the n equals 1 part, it works nicely. Are there questions? OK. So now what I'd like to look at is n equals 1 superspace. And just to remind us what the n equals 1 algebra looks like, I have q's and q bars. I have q's anti-commuting with themselves. I have q's anti-commuting with the p's. And I have p's commuting with themselves. So here. I've started calling the supersymmetry transformation generators Q. They're P's in the language over there. They're generating a translation in a space. What I'm going to have is a coset element omega. Well, here I before I wrote it as e to the i x dot P. But now I've got lots of X's and P's. And so I'm going to write it this way. Equals e to the i regular x P, regular space, plus theta Q plus theta bar Q bar. So these Q's are P's for generated translations in the theta directions. Because the Q's are fermions, the thetas are fermions. So the exponential is well defined. And I have everything I need now to go through and crank through this formalism with the minor complication of that when the commutators are both involving fermionic objects, the commutator becomes an anti-commutator. So what I tell you to do, if you do one other thing after, well, you don't have to do this during lunchtime, but you can do it maybe this afternoon, not during Edward's talk, but after his talk. Calculate g inverse dg, or omega inverse d omega for this omega. Not so hard to do. It's not so hard to do because of the beautiful fact of the supersymmetry algebra that the triple commutators are all zero. Because the double commutators, the worst they can do is give you a p. And then a p commutes with everything. And so although this looks like an awful exponential, it's not so bad. The commutators cut off. It allows you to write down closed form expressions. And do it. Just do it. And write down for me, do it for yourself. I mean, write down what these covariant derivatives are and use them to define left derivatives, which I can call Qs, the differential operators that implement the isometries, and uh, right derivatives, which I can call covariant derivatives. I guess I can just leave that there. And you find 
the alpha is d by d theta alpha plus i sigma alpha alpha dot a theta bar alpha dot d a. You find d bar alpha dot is equal d by d theta dot bar alpha minus i theta alpha sigma alpha alpha dot a d a. And you can check that they obey the right commutation relations, that d alpha and d beta give zero, and d alpha and d alpha dot give exactly the supersymmetry algebra like they're supposed to. Well, uh, I have to be a little careful here. Uh, minus 2i. Because the translation generator is represented by dA is equal to, oh. Help me, help me, help me. Husky cried. Well, th these are the d's so that have the right sign as the algebra. And, uh, well, so I never promised you a rose garden in these lectures. The problem is I copied these from many different books and the eyes are in completely different places. And right now, I'm not sure where the eye belongs here. Well, I guess I can figure it out. D by d theta, this gives me a plus i. And then it gives me a DA. And a plus I DA well, there's also a minus sign issue. But anyway, this is the point is it obeys the supersymmetry algebra when I put the I's in the right place. Then I can define the Q's, which are the differential operators that generate the isometries. So I will start every lecture with an error correction board. I'm going to write these down correctly for you at the beginning of the next lecture, because if you walk out of one thing, a second thing that you do in this, this course, you better get these right. And so it behooves me to write down what the right answer is for you. Unless, Igor, you can just fix it. I think the sign is right because the sign should be opposite from that and the two algebra. Uh, the covariant derivatives were supposed to obey exactly the real algebra. And then the Q differential operators have the opposite sign because they correspond to induced motions. And I'm a little worried that that sign gives me the um, wrong sign. Maybe. I'm, I'm not going to try to fix this in real time. And then I have a Q bar. But since none of the formulas are right, I'm not going to write them down. But the important point is then that the Qs the differential operators commute, and the Q's and the Q bars give me a P with the opposite sign, and then the D's and the Q's commute. Check them. The problem here, you see, was that the fancy formalism that gave me these covariant derivatives came out of a paper where the generators were anti-Hermitian. And in my book, they're Hermitian. And there's eyes relating them. And I put them in the wrong place. So now the point is that these operators act on superfields. And superfields 
our functions of x, theta, and theta bar. <clears throat> I can define it to be omega acting on the field at zero, as we did yesterday. And uh, then you can calculate delta phi in terms of uh, these differential operators. and figure it all out. Now, since these thetas are Grossman variables, a field phi actually has a power series expansion in terms of them. And it keeps going. But it terminates at a certain point. Because these are all anti-commuting, at some point the, the power series stops. And so each one of these superfields contains a finite number of extra fields. Finite number of regular fields. And they're related to each other all by supersymmetry because the differential operators act on the thetas and the and so they'll pull down, you know, the, the variation of this field is related to this field, and the variation of this field is related to the derivative of that field and that field, and so on. And so they're all related to each other by a supersymmetry. And so it's a very sweet and powerful formalism because it gives you the supersymmetry transformations immediately in terms of these differential operators acting on these fields. However, there's also a problem. There's nothing free in life. And the problem... is that there are too many fields. For example, we know there's a beautiful representation, the chiral massless representation with two scalars and a vial spinner. Where is it? This goes on forever. Well, not forever, but there's quite a few component fields. And so what we need is constraints. We need covariant constraints. And the covariant constraints are what reduce the number of component degrees of freedom to give you the physical multiplets. They have to be covariant constraints because they still have to respect supersymmetry. The differential operators that generate supersymmetry have to be consistent with the constraints. And so the answer is staring at you uh, right um, under your nose, you typically want to make the differential constraints in terms of the Ds. But before I do that, I'd like to talk about invariant actions, and then we'll impose the constraints. My claim to you is that an action, which is an integral over all four x, but it's also an integral over all four thetas, and it's built out of local fields and the derivatives of local fields, the covariant derivatives of these fields, such an action is automatically supersymmetry invariant. Well, how can I prove that for you? First thing is that for Grassmann variables, and I'm just going to state this, integration is equivalent to differentiation. At heart, it's because these variables square to zero, and so there's only two things you can do, and it boils down to being the same thing. And so instead of integrating over this, what I want to do is take my Lagrangian and operate on it with all four Ds. So I have four Ds. I can take my Lagrangian, and then I can take the lowest component, which is theta equals theta bar is equal to zero. Well, does that make sense? Let's just look for a second. These d's are basically d by d thetas plus a piece that has a space-time derivative. The space-time derivative piece goes right through and is annihilated because I have a d4x. And so this is basically just d by d theta, d by d theta, d by d theta bar, d by d theta bar. But that's just what 
d by d theta, d by d theta, d by <laughs> d theta bar, d theta bar is. And then you can take the, the lowest component. So that's automatically supersymmetric. Now, I claim that. Let's prove it. So how do you check it's supersymmetric? Well, it's made out of superfields. And so the variation of this action is equal to the integral d 4 x d squared, d bar squared, the variation of L. But the variation of L is just given by epsilon q plus epsilon bar q bar acting on the Lagrangian, taking the lowest component. Because these differential operators implement the supersymmetry transformations. But look, look at the difference between the q's and the q bars, and, and, and the d's. A q is the same as a d up to a term which has a derivative in it. It's got the opposite sign on the derivative term. But because the q is the same as the d's, under a d4 theta, this is the same as the integral d4x d squared d bar squared epsilon d bar plus epsilon epsilon d plus epsilon bar d bar acting on the Lagrangian. Because I'm under d4x. You can't complain. I also know that the d's commute with the d bars by construction. And so this then is the integral of d4x d squared. For example, a term which is, well, let's do it this way, epsilon d plus epsilon bar d bar d bar squared acting on the Lagrangian. But wait, these are anti-commuting objects. There are only two of them. Here I got three of them next to each other. There's no way to preserve that without them being zero. This term goes away. Oh, I have three anti-commuting d bars next to each other. There's no way to preserve it. There's no way, there's no, it has to be zero. No way to preserve the anti-symmetry. And so the supersymmetry invariant of act invariance of actions written in superspace is automatic. You don't have to check it. It's just true. And it's true because we've built the action in terms of fields that transform covariantly and their covariant derivatives that transform covariantly, which is why we went through all the agony of driving those covariant derivatives. Okay? So then in order to talk about n equals 1 supersymmetry, we just need to find the set of covariant constraints that reduce the ungodly number of component fields in a superfield to a rational set. And I'm going to speed up for some of this because some of this now is pretty much out of my book. And I am going to assume that you've at least looked at it at some extent. And I'm mostly going through it so quickly in order to just set up the stage for what follows. So a chiral multiplet is the canonical example. It obeys the constraint that d bar alpha dot phi of x theta and theta bar is equal to zero. It's a consistent constraint. You always have to check the consistency of these constraints. For example, if this is true, what happens when I impose another d bar. Is that still zero? Fortunately, it is, because the anti-commutator uh, commutator of two d bars is equal to zero. It's consistent. Oh, what if I impose the d on it? Well, that's OK. I get zero going this way. I get something non-trivial going the other way. And the right-hand side, I get a derivative. And so that's fine. You need to check the integrability conditions of the constraints. This one is perfectly consistent. That's good. And it's also covariant which means that the supersymmetry variation of phi goes right through the derivative because it's written in terms of a covariant derivative. I claim the solution is that I can write phi of x theta and theta bar equals some phi of x minus i theta sigma theta bar theta and zero. So in arbitrary function of y and theta, where y is equal to x minus i blah, 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 automatically satisfies the constraint that d bar on it is equal to 0. So in some senses, we'll, as you see, chiral superfields, 
exist in a smaller space than full superfields. You'll hear that again tomorrow. But because of that, then I can look at the degrees of freedom here. And I can only really need to do is this power series expansion in theta. And so that phi is equal to phi of x plus theta chi psi of x plus theta theta f of x. And it stops. Well, I shouldn't call it x. I really should call it, well, I can call it y. And then the higher components in theta bar are generated by the power series expansion here, right? This is a complex scalar, has dimension one, and it's a complex scalar. Thetas have dimension a half, so this has dimension three half. It is a vial spinner. These have dimension minus one half minus a half, which is minus one, so F has dimension two, and it's an auxiliary field. And those are the only fields that are contained in the chiral superfield, as you can tell by solving the constraint explicitly. So that's your n equals 1 chiral multiplet. And you can also then work out what the supersymmetry transformations are by applying the differential operators d by d, the q's, right? And the q's will map these fields one into another. the whole point, right? These, these things, these Q's have d by d thetas in them, for example. And so, for example, the variation of the lowest component pulls down the next component. The variation of this component pulls down this component. The d by dx piece pushes something up. And so the variation of this will also, the variation of this will contain the derivative of that as it gets pulled up. Anyway, you can check that the differential operators say that on the fields that this is indeed true. Those are the supersymmetry transformations. Look, notice there is no mention of the Lagrangian anywhere. Those close off shell without using any sorts of equations of motion. So off shell without using any equations of motion, you see we actually have also Bose Fermi symmetry, but instead of two by two, two plus two propagating degrees of freedom, we have a total of four plus four degrees of freedom. So off shell. Vial spinner, complex two-dimensional, so there's four, complex F and a complex phi. We're done. What does the Lagrangian look like? I claim a nice action is D bar annihilates phi, but D bar does not annihilate phi bar. So this action doesn't vanish. And then I can actually also write, for fun, another term. The product of two chiral superfields stays chiral. If, del, if d bar annihilates phi, d bar annihilates phi star, phi squared. The invariance of this term is automatic because as, I, as I've checked the variations of the q's and the q bars, remember I could get extra d's and I have four d's here. This one's a little trickier. Here the variation has a d and a d bar piece, right? Well, the d piece goes away because d cubed is 0. The d bar piece goes away because it's acting on a chiral superfield. 
So as long as I just have a chiral superfield here, I'm also allowed to write down an invariant that looks like that. And if I put this into components again, I get d for x, I've got to go fast, minus d phi, d phi star, minus i psi da da psi bar, plus f star f, plus m phi f, minus m over 2 psi squared, minus m over 2 psi bar squared. Beautiful. That's what this is in components. So look, this looks like a propagating boson. Look, this looks like a propagating fermion. Look, this doesn't have any derivatives. It's not propagating. It was dimension 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. It's got the right dimension. Its equation of motion is just a constraint. The equation of motion of f is just that f star is equal to m phi. Very good. Put f star equals m phi into these transformations. You get the component transformations I wrote down before. Look, put f star equals m phi, calculate its variation. This is just automatically satisfied because it's the equation of motion of the fermion. Well, here it's called chi, here it's called psi, uh, sorry. And so all is well. Let me just add, for a chiral multiplet, I can actually put any analytic function of the chiral field here. So all of this holds not only for a massive multiplet, but for something more complicated, the higher order corrections, the higher order terms give things like Yukawa couplings and even worse. This analytic function is called a superpotential. And it contains in it a regular potential v, which is the derivative of the, super, of, of the superpotential squared. And it contains Yukawa couplings, which are related by the double analytic derivative of the superpotential. That multiplet <clears throat> is in um, all the textbooks. It's the canonical example. A multiplet that's not in all of the textbooks is a linear multiplet. And I introduce it to you because you'll see it again tomorrow uh, when I talk about n equals 2. And the linear multiplet also obeys a set of chiral co uh, consistent constraints. But first, let me just motivate what this linear multiplet is all about before um, I write it in superfields. So in four dimensions, I can have a two-form gauge field, BAB, anti-symmetric. And it has an invariance. under a gauge transformation that looks something like that. And if you are really good, you can, you can tell me that how many degrees of freedom are contained in this, how many propagating degrees of freedom are contained in this two form. But rather than ask you to do that, and rather than have me try to do that in front of you, where I will certainly get it wrong, I'm going to show you a trick which tells you how many degrees of freedom are contained in this two form. So the first thing I'd like to do is to construct the field strength associated with the two form, which it's a three form and it's invariant, right? This three form obeys a Bianchi identity, which is that epsilon a, b, c, d, d, a, H, B, C, D is equal to zero. I just carry along these anti-symmetric signs just so that 
you remember that it's anti-symmetric. This is automatic because of the definition of H in terms of the curl of B. And it has an equation of motion, which is basically that dA acting on H, A, B, C is equal to zero. Many degrees of freedom are propagating on shell. What I'm going to do is to tell you about a duality which relates this field to a scalar field. So what I'd like to do is to say that this field strength, H A B C, is equal to epsilon A B C D of D D on a scalar field. <coughs> and what, is, what do we learn when we now look at this scalar field and we look at the Bianchi identity and we look at the equation of motion? Well, so what is Bianchi? Bianchi said, which was basically the derivative with respect to A of H, B, C, D, anti-symmetrized, epsilon A, B, C, D. Now, hmm, so H in the, in the duality has an epsilon. I have an epsilon contracted with an epsilon. Three of the indices are contracted. That just gives me a delta. And so this being zero is the same as box phi is equal to zero. And the equation of motion, which says that d a h a b c equals zero, when applied to this, says that epsilon a, b, c, d, d, c, d, d, phi is zero. And so the Bianchi for h became an equation of motion for phi, and the equation of motion for h became the Bianchi on phi. And so that tells you right away that the system of this crazy anti-symmetric tensor actually is equivalent to a single real scalar field. So there's one propagating degree of freedom. And so what the linear multiplet does in supersymmetry is it takes a chiral multiplet and it takes away one of the scalars and turns it into an anti-symmetric tensor. Now, so in superspace, what I'm going to find is a superfield gamma, it's equal to gamma bar. That's fine. That's a supersymmetric constraint. No problem when you act with a supersymmetry generator on it. I'm also going to say that d squared gamma is equal to zero. Those are covariant derivatives. No problem. Supersymmetric. What you can do is you can expand gamma then and find it's some scalar field, which I can call A of x, real scalar, plus theta chi of x, plus theta sigma theta bar VA, plus fields with terms with derivatives on the fields. And VA has the constraint that dA VA is equal to zero. But the constraint dA VA equals zero says that VA is equal to epsilon A B C D H B C D equals, uh, that's what VA is. And then the constraint that D dot V equals zero is the Bianchi. And so this multiplet really does contain one plus one boson and four fermions. Off shell, it's kind of cute, actually. Here I have four degrees of freedom, right? Four 
complex numbers. Here I have 1 plus 4 minus 1 is 4. So this multiplet actually has no auxiliary fields at all. But it's still supersymmetric. And so what I'd like to do is to do, show you just a formal manipulation to show how in superspace you can prove the equivalence between this multiplet and a chiral multiplet. So duality. I'm going to write as my action the integral d4x d squared d bar squared minus 1 half gamma squared plus gamma times phi plus phi bar, where this is chiral. And at this point, this is unconstrained. And what I'd like to do is to look at the equation of motion of gamma and look at the equation of motion of phi. Now, for a chiral superfield, the variation of a chiral superfield has to stay chiral. So it needs something like d bar squared times something, which is the variation. I don't know what to call it. We want the variation of a chiral superfield to stay chiral. But a random old variation doesn't stay chiral. And so you better put a d bar squared in front of a random variation to keep it chiral. And so then if I try to vary for the equation of motion of the phi, I get d bar squared acting on that variation. But then I can integrate it by parts and find that the variation of phi is that d bar squared gamma equals 0, which is the same as the constraint d squared gamma equals 0 by the reality condition. And I can look at the variation of gamma. Now, this was unconstrained, so I can just vary it. And so it says that gamma is equal to phi plus phi bar, right? I can plug gamma equals phi plus phi bar back into this action and find that the action then just goes down to And so I have converted this action, which was the action for a linear multiplet, into the action for a chiral multiplet by adding a chiral field and saying, oh, let's just forget the fact that this field was linear and the equation of motion for that field made it linear, right? So that can be done at no cost. And then since this field now has no constraints, I can just eliminate it by its equation of motion and bring it right into the form of a chiral field. So these are completely equivalent. And finally, the third, the final multiplet that I'd like to talk about in n equals 1 superspace is a vector multiplet. And that just obeys the constraint that v is equal to v bar. Now that's, it. that v is undefined up to a shift where v bar lambda is equal to 0. It's chiral. And I'm going to check to put minuses here to agree with my notes. And so this is like a gauge transformation. And it's like an abelian gauge transformation. And so that's why this is called a vector superfield. I can use this transformation 
by picking a V and V lambda and lambda dagger to get rid of certain components of V. And then I write this V then in something called the West Semino gauge. And in the West Semino gauge, it has the form theta sigma A theta bar A A plus theta 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 bar lambda bar plus theta bar theta bar theta lambda plus theta 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 bar D. Again, this is a vector field of dimension one. It has, there's actually a residual gauge invariance under, well, that's a scalar. This is a spinner of dimension three half. This is the gluino, glu, gluon, this is the gluino. This is an auxiliary field of dimension two, right? In the Lagrangian, it has to be d squared. It can't propagate because it's dimension two. And so this is the off-shell version of the vector multiplet. The transformations, the supersymmetry transformations, look something like that's the field strength. What I want you to notice about these transformations are, and something I'm going to use next time, one of the components transforms only into fields and no derivatives. Then we go up to the middle components where there's some derivatives, some fields. We keep going, we keep going, we keep going. And at the end, we get to a transformation that only has derivatives. The field the transformation that only has derivatives is the auxiliary field. Go back and check the n equals 1 transformations for the, for the um, uh, chiral multiplet. You'll see the same thing. <laughs> that one? Also, I can make something called W alpha, which is d bar squared d alpha v. This is chiral and it's gauge invariant. Well, how to check the gauge invariance? D annihilates lambda bar because it's chiral. D does not annihilate lambda because it's chiral. I mean, it's D bar annihilates it. But I can take the anti-commutator of a D and a D bar and the D bar term and annihilates it at the cost of leaving a total derivative. But the extra D bar goes through the total derivative and annihilates it. And so it's chiral and gauge invariant. And that superfield has a nice expansion too. higher order terms. And as you see, this superfield, gauge invariant, only contains the field strength as it should. And that we have now have the tools we need then to write down n equals 1 coupled to matter. And I will do that on this beautiful, clean blackboard, which can't be moved because it's the last one. It's chiral. And since this is chiral, 
d squared of it is supersymmetric, as we said before. which is gauge invariant when phi goes to e to the lambda phi. Chiral transformation of a chiral field stays chiral, gauge invariant. And then what I can write down as superpotential where the superpotential has to be gauge invariant. For simplicity, what I've done here is assumed I've just done an abelian theory but you can jazz it up for the non-abelian case. And that's, in fact, what Edward used in his lectures yesterday. And since now I'm five minutes over, I have almost gotten to where I wanted to be today. We've done n equals 0, n equals 1 superspace, invariant actions, the three different multiplets. Okay, well, I only need a few more minutes. So let me, I'll do the last thing then, which is n equals 2 in terms of n equals 1 superfields. We have all the ingredients we need to write that down. Easy. So yesterday I ended 15 minutes early because I got confused. So today we make up that time. So we do n equals 2 in terms of n equals 1. And what I'd like to do is to look at first the case of hypers. Well, hypers contain two n equals 1 chiral multiplets because they're four degrees of freedom. And so the action should be something like the integral d4x d squared d bar squared phi bar i phi i lowest component. And I can add a mass term if I want to. The n equals 1 is manifest because it's written in terms of n equals 1 superspace. We don't need to talk about it. We don't even need to ever check it. But we have to check the n equals 2. And so my claim for you is that this is supersymmetric under an n equals 2 transformation, which looks like this. A chiral field had better rotate into a chiral field. So it has a d bar squared because d bar annihilates it because d bar cubed is 0. Well, you know, you're not allowed to just write down random coordinates when you're doing n equals 1 because that will break the covariance of n equals 1. But here we're doing n equals 2. This is an n equals 2 transformation, so it's okay to have real coordinates in here. So here's the supersymmetry parameter eta. And you can check that this closes into the n equals 2 algebra. It requires that the mass is equal to the central charge. It requires that d squared phi i is equal to m epsilon i j phi bar j, the equation of motion for the chiral multiplet. 
for the case of the vector, oh, oh, I wasn't planning on using this, but it's right there. It's almost perfect. For the case of the vector, I now would like to have a massless vector, n equals 2 vector multiplet. So it needs a n equals 1 vector multiplet plus an n equals 1 chiral multiplet. No superfield. And my claim is that, yeah, no superpotential. My claim is that this has an n equals, this has n equals 1 manifest. It has n equals 2 under the transformation that delta phi better go into something chiral and of the right dimension. That actually is chiral and of the right dimension. This thing has to be real like a vector multiplet. Is. And this side is real. And my claim is that, again, up to a gauge transformation, this Lagrangian is invariant under these n equals 2 supersymmetry transformations. Check the closure. Check the closure. And you'll find it closes. It works beautifully. In fact, you'll find equations of motion not needed. Hmm. Hmm. Equations of motion not needed. This tells you that the auxiliary fields that are contained in this Lagrangian are enough. You don't need any more. And what are they? Well, what sort of auxiliary fields did we have? We had an auxiliary field which is F, and we had an auxiliary field which is D. And if you look in the old literature for n equals 2 superspace, what they have is an auxiliary field which is a symmetric isospin D, D, I, J. There's three symmetric Ds in the literature, and they are in this language, just F and D. And so what we've found is for the vector multiplet, n equals 1 superspace is as good as n equals 2 superspace. But for the chiral multiplet, the hypermultiplet, it's not. In fact, as we'll see tomorrow, when we're actually doing the case, the superspace for n equals 2 superspace, the finite number of auxiliary fields here comes out beautifully. And we're going to find that we need an infinite number of auxiliary fields to deal with the case of the hypermultiplet. But we can't panic. If we keep our wits about us and organize them well, it's not too hard. And the final thing that I wanted to do was to talk just for a second about what happens when I change this from n equals 2 in terms of n equals 1. What if I change this to d equals 5 in terms of n equals 1? And it's almost exactly the same. Because essentially, I should think of masses, where the masses are the same as the central charge, as coming from a Kaluza-Klein reduction of an extra dimension. Right? If all of my fields have a wave function that goes like e to the i m x 5, a d by d x 5 pulls down a mass. And so essentially, anywhere I see a mass in, an n equal, in a short n equals 2 representation, I can think of it as coming from a Kaluza-Klein reduction. And so we're done. Well, the d4x becomes d5x, very good. This term stays the way it is. Uh, this term, oh, has a mass in it. And so this becomes a mass plus i d5. Hmm. This goes along just fine. Oh. This has a mass plus i d5. Check it. Check the closure. 
Convince yourself that when you eliminate the auxiliary fields and write this in components, it's actually five-dimensionally Lorentz invariant. Certainly doesn't look five-dimensionally Lorentz invariant. That was the cost of writing this in terms of n equals one superfields, which are four-dimensional by their very nature. So if I'm willing to throw away manifest five-dimensional covariance and write it in terms of four-dimensional fields, I have a beautiful reduction. But that's a very natural thing to do, of course, when you have brain foliations of a fifth dimension or something like that. Uh, exercise to you, figure out how this lifts to five dimensions. After you do all those other calculations at lunch. Thank you.